I'm a, uh, usually I'm, my wife told me I should try to look friendly because I'm, I'm the kind of guy who looks pretty grumpy all the time. <laughs> and I know why that is. Maybe because I'm a softer person and stumbling over things. Um, but this guy up here, this is me back <laughs> in the someone late 70s, early 80s. Uh, if you look closely, you can all, almost see the, the wrinkles already. This guy, um, the reason why he's looking like this, because he just got his first computer. And I don't know if anybody remembers the old Commodore C64. Does anybody remember this one? Sure. Yeah? That's what he wanted. That's what the cool kids had. This is what I got. The, I don't know if you can see it. It's a VIC-20. Yeah, right. 3.6 kilobyte of RAM that you can use. And you can see up here, uh, 20 or 22 characters per line. You essentially had to scroll down if you wanted to read the Twitter message. And there was the C64, the one I wanted, which had four times the screen, uh, screen resolution. It was basically was the retina of the 80s. <laughs> so, uh, the good thing is I wasn't even supposed to get this anyway because my mother, she was like, nobody, nobody needs computers. The boy's nine years old. What, what would he do with a computer? Nobody needs these things. He should do something, something useful like go to school, play outside, or wash the dishes or something. And uh, actually my grandfather, he was a very old-fashioned guy. He, he knew very much about what a boy needs when he grew up in the 1930s. But he was the one who was so insightful and said, this is something the boy's going to need. And he bought this computer for me. He got this old black and white TV, hooked it up somewhere in the attic of his house, where I stay a lot. And, well, that was my new computer. I'm, a, I'm a, the kind of person that likes to uh, know how things work. I'm very curious. And this is why I, the first thing I did, I took the screwdriver, opened the computer up, took it apart. It was oh, interesting, nice. And then, well, shit. That's how I got my C64, finally. <laughs> and because I still like to know how things work, and I wasn't allowed to take it apart anymore, that's how I got into software. Does anybody remember these magazines? Yeah. Uh, there, are probably mag there were probably magazines like this in the States or in the Netherlands. But uh, here, uh, you could learn a lot about your computers. For instance, down here, you can't read it, but this is uh, Interessanten Adressen auf der Spur, tracking down interesting addresses. And this is not about web addresses. This is about, about literal addresses in the memory of the computer. Because essentially, this is how you, uh, how you used to program them. I mean, Dave probably knew much more sophisticated computers back then than I did. But this, this is what I learned with. And we had these magazines, and in, in the magazines we had these listings, like four, five, six pages of uh, program code which you could type into your computer, and all of a sudden you had a new program. This language, it's called BASIC, but essentially it's machine language. You have a little bit of control structure up there, but essentially it's all these bytes of data that you literally poke, that's a command, poke into interesting addresses in your memory. So, with all these numbers, it was quite easy to get them wrong. And uh, we don't have any debuggers, and no way to tell, except for going through every number, is it right, every line, page for page. And uh, I probably wasn't the only one who struggled with this, which is uh, why the publishers invent invented these nice things back here. Does anybody know what these are? Checksums. Checksums, right. Oh, you've been there. <laughs> yeah, so finally you type programs into your computer and they worked, something happened. You, you spent maybe an afternoon punching your keyboard and all of a sudden you had something new, you had a new game or you had a new program like a, I don't know, personal finance budgeting application which is the greatest thing for an 11 year old kid, except I probably wouldn't get any allowance for the next 20 years because I broke that old BIC 20. But anyway, back then it was pretty easy, pretty simple for, for a boy like me in my early teens to understand how a computer worked. 
to understand how the, how a piece of software worked. The software didn't do much. Didn't do much. It did pretty much one thing, like Manuel said, sometimes even well. <laughs> and as my mother said, nobody's going to use, nobody's going to need computers. It, in this instance, she was not right. The time has passed, now it's 30 years later, and we have computers everywhere. We have software within everything that we use. It's all around us. And it has become so complicated. It was simple back then, it's become more and more, I don't know, complicated or complex? I always confuse the two. Does anybody know the difference between complicated and complex? Oh, explain. Oh, shit. Yeah, explain. <laughs> no, even this is complicated. No, I just go with complicated. I'm fine with it. I don't get the difference. But anyway, uh, it's become, become even so complex that people started writing books with uh, having this in the title, Domain-Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. Who knows this book? Who read it? To which page? <laughs> I read it. To which page? Huh? To which page? Yeah, the first time I read it, I was like, yeah, nice, this is entities and, and here, value objects and repositories. Yeah, I get it. I get domain driven design. This is easy. I didn't. It took me three times. It's not an easy read. It took me three times until I went through the whole book. So it took me three times until I went to the part that was important. Even Eric Evans, the author, says if he got to write this book again, he'd put the second part, the one somewhere back here, up front, because nobody ever reads it. <laughs> Domain-driven design. Uh, I don't know, what, what, what is this domain anyway? Domain is one of these terms that everybody talks about. We have a domain.dll or a domain package or something like this. But essentially a domain has nothing to do with anything technical. The domain is the world an organization lives in. The domain of a bank is banking. The domain of an accounting firm is accounting, finances, bookkeeping. And the domain of an event organizer is events, speakers, venues, catering. We watered this down a lot because we taught the domain people to speak our language. Nowadays, they, speak, they, they talk about tables and objects and forms and databases, and stuff like that. They use verbs like create, read, update, delete. No, we don't delete, we archive. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> the domains in themselves are so expressive because they contain all the knowledge, all the complexity, all the richness. And the people were so desperate for us software people to understand what they need to understand them that they learned our language instead of us learning theirs. So we wanted this down a lot, but essentially the domain is all the richness. And then, of course, we have the model. The model is what we distill from the domain so that we can solve specific problems. Now, what do, you, what do we do to, uh, to get to such a model? The most important thing, sit down, listen to the people who know about the domain. So what we learned is we sit down and we listen to them speaking, and whenever they use things like nouns, uh, we write this down because this is a great candidate for a class. That's what we learned. And then they say, announce like customer or order and then they say use verbs like cancel order or blacklist customer and we write these down these are candidates for our methods and then we have relationships because a customer orders things so he has a lo lots of orders and the orders have line items which again uh, represent uh, an article in our product catalog and then they want it shipped to a certain address and they want it built to a different address and the invoice for, we need an invoice for every order which has to be printed out and then we need 
all that stuff and we build all these relationships and everything belongs uh, to each other and that's how it is that's how the world is i mean an order has a line item and a customer if he ordered something has an order this is how it works and this is how we model if we don't watch out this is what we get to the enterprise model I recently worked with a company who actually wanted this because they had this, uh, they're a pretty old company, they are, more, they are more than 100 years old and they have a very, very rich domain, core domain they work in, uh, but they had this consultancy come in just recently and they told them uh, they should generalize, they should, should uh, bring everybody to use a common language throughout the whole company and uh, everybody, uh, we need this model, this generic model where everybody, where we have a word and when everybody uses the same words and in the end nothing didn't mean anything anymore. Everything became really, really complicated. And this is what happens a lot. For some reason it still does. And uh, we try not to build this one model. We should try to focus on separate different models. But then people say, but we're, you, we're uh, building a ubiquitous... That's the worst name pattern I've ever come, <laughs> come across. That. Ubiquitous language. Um, but we read domain-driven design and we're doing domain-driven design. We're creating this ubiquitous language where everyone ne uh, uses the same words. Yeah, right. Ubiquitous, ubiquitous language actually is in front of the book. So people read it. But it's wrong. You're doing it wrong. A ubiquitous language doesn't exist throughout a whole organization, throughout one big domain. Because within an organization with a, with a certain amount of complexity, you have different people doing different jobs and different departments working with different things. What is, what is this customer anyway? When it comes to a, a, like an e-commerce application, when you have marketing, marketing doesn't talk about customers. We force them to because we want this one model to rule them all. But they don't talk about they don't talk about people at all. They talk about target groups. Sales might talk about leads or prospects. They're, these are no customers. They haven't bought anything from us. Then there's a website. On the website, we might have a visitor, or maybe even just an IP address or a session. Maybe nothing. And then there's a shopping cart and somebody actually buys something. That's when they become a customer. But still, people might internally still not refer to as a customer, but as a buyer. And then there's shipping. In the warehouse, people talk about the recipient. The address, where do I send this package to? And then if the package didn't arrive, they call. Hey, where's my stuff? I'm a complainant. Well, I might be a customer as well, but right now I'm a complainant. Or I might be somebody else calling for the customer. I don't know, but from a, from a, from a hotline point of view, from a customer service point of view, the language is very clear. So each of these contexts has their own language. This everything points down to this one customer in the end, but essentially everybody needs to know different things about the customer. Everybody provides different services to the customer. The data we use and the behavior we implement is different for each and every of these contexts. Even though everybody talks about this customer. And then again, Let's say we have a purchasing department where they buy the goods that we sell, buy it from a different vendor from, or from vendors. Now who's the customer there? It's me, it's us. So we use the same term over here. And then in our database, <coughs> sorry, then in our database, we have fields and flags like customer, uh, purchasing customer, no, uh, selling customer and stuff like that. I've seen, I've seen models like, let me go back like this, with a customer and a order sitting within the net like a spider. 
with so many legs, like a centipede is actually, with so many legs uh, connected to everything outside. So, we have different languages, and each of these containers are essentially defined by the language that's being used inside. And this is what Eric Evans in Domain Room Design calls a bounded context. And if you've uh, read things about microservices or heard a couple of talks about microservices, this term comes, comes up quite often. Especially when people ask, uh, just at the micro, micro exchange in the panel, there was somebody asking, how do I know how to cut my services? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But if you get it wrong, you're in trouble. Because if you have a big monolith and you get your component boundaries wrong, well, you can still do something about it. But if you build microservices and you got your context boundaries wrong, you're in trouble. Because it doesn't work as intended. And this is why it's so important to first think about our domains, to first think about the richness and the expressiveness of the domains, and then we think about which, which specific problems are we trying to solve, and we draw out our models. And we have different models for different parts of our application. And these are our bounded contexts. So we essentially take these and take them apart. Conceptually, not necessarily technologically, but as a concept, they're different things. I don't care if you make microservices out of them or if you just put them into different packages, packages or namespaces or whatever your flavor of complementization, does that work? Is. <laughs> Works. <laughs> Yeah, but these are, you, uh, in every complex application, the, the important thing is to think about how can I tell things apart and not try to have everything do pretty much the same. And these bounded contexts have a couple of key attributes, which I'm not going to read to you, but you can read yourselves. And the interesting thing about this is these are the basic attributes of a microservice. These are the stepping stones to microservices. If you don't do this, a microservice architecture is not going to help you. There is a lot more you have to think about if you employ this style. But this work you will have to do in the first place. And then afterwards, it's basically, as I said, maybe a little bit uh, drastically, microservices are an implementation detail. Of course, it might be useful to use this kind of an architecture. But monoliths are, we had this, we're having this discussion a lot in the last couple of months. Monoliths are not bad. They are not a bad thing. Um, but they become difficult if you don't have the discipline to tell, to, to, to separate the parts. And you don't, if you don't have the discipline to separate things within a monolith, a microservice architecture is probably not really going to help you. So the important rules, the important takeaways, we don't model reality. Just because a thing in the real world has another thing, we don't need to model a relationship. We only model it if it's helpful. And we don't build this one huge model that's good for everyone. So essentially, I don't care how big or small a microservice is. I, if, if it's five, or if it's the head of, of James Lewis, or <laughs> I don't care if you use Zookeeper or Console or etcd or whatever for service discovery, what you use for monitoring and for logging. I think it's very important to think about what we're trying to build. I think it's very important to get back to the point where we can understand what we're building, to break things down into small parts 
that in themselves do one thing and do it well. And then maybe a small, ch a small teenager like myself 30 years ago would again be able to understand what we're doing because essentially I'm no smarter today. I don't get things if they're too complicated. And this is why I like the approach. Thank you.